Welcome to Chapter 2, Using Dietary Recommendations, Food Guides, and Food Labels to Plan Your Menus. Dietary recommendations have been published in the United States for healthy Americans for many years and is referred to as the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. They're developed jointly by the USDA and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. These guidelines discuss food groups, food and nutrition to eat for optimal health. They are written in easy to understand terms. The dietary reference intakes that we talked about in Chapter 1, on the other hand, deal with specific nutrients. Food guides, on the other hand, tell us more specifically the amount of food that we need to eat to have a nutritionally adequate diet. So that's what we're going to cover a lot of today is food guides. The primary role of that food guide is to communicate an optimum diet for overall health of our you know, entire population. These are based on dietary recommendations, nutrient content of foods, and also the eating habits of targeted populations. The most current food guide is the My Plate. It's based on the Dietary Guidelines for Americans and the DRIs. My Plate includes what and how much to eat from the five food groups for a variety of calorie levels and for a variety of eating styles, such as vegetarian, Mediterranean style, and also Asian diet. So what are our objectives for today? We're going to explain just how that My Plate works including identifying the nutritional contributions from each of the food groups. We're going to talk about some of the major concepts in the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. We're also going to interpret information on a packaged food label and also a little bit about restaurant menus. There's a copy of the MyPlate handout in the module for your reference throughout the semester. Use this as a guide for planning menus and meals. There's also a sample of the nutrition fact label in the module as a handout that provides a thorough overview of understanding the label. And I would definitely spend some time looking at both of those, which will be a really good reference throughout the semester. Dietary recommendations are guidelines that discuss the food groups, foods, and also nutrients to eat for optimal health. Recommendations come from a variety of sources. The seventh edition, which is the most current, is a very comprehensive 95-page document intended to be used in developing educational materials. It also aids policymakers in designing and carrying out nutrition-related programs, including the federal nutrition assistance and also education programs. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans also serves as a basis for nutrition messages and consumer materials that are developed for educators and health professionals, for the general public, and also specific audiences such as children. This document is based on recommendations of the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. This is a group of scientific experts that analyze the most current information on diet and health and incorporate it into this scientific evidence-based document. By law, it's reviewed and updated and published every five years. So the current document that we're looking at is 2015 through 2020. From the dietary recommendations, food guides are then developed, and those are guidelines that tell us the kinds and amounts of food to make a nutritionally adequate diet. So an example of the food guide is the My Plate. You might recall in previous years, we've had several versions of what we have now, the My Plate. Um, the USDA's first nutrition guide was actually published in 1894. In 1943, during World War II, the USDA introduced the basic seven food groups to help maintain nutritional standards under wartime food rationing. From 1956 until 1992, the USDA recommended the basic four food groups, which I think a lot of you have probably heard about. 
In 1992, they further perfected their recommendations by designing the Food Guide Pyramid, which was actually an education tool that looked like a pyramid and had the foundation, meaning the most important uh, foods to build in your menus at the basis of the pyramid, all the way to the top, which would be the lesser important foods that you should eat, such as excess fats and also sugars. The pyramid version included recommended servings of each food group, which the previous guides didn't. Then in 2005, it was updated to what we called the My Pyramid, which replaced the other levels of the Food Guide Pyramid with colorful vertical wedges. And they also added an image of a climber on the side of the pyramid to represent the importance of exercise, you know, in our daily lifestyle. So now we have what we call the My Plate, and a very important website for you to get intimate with would be choosemyplate.gov. The most current food guide is the My Plate. My Plate includes what and how much to eat from all the five food groups for a variety of calorie needs and for a variety of eating styles, such as vegetarian and Mediterranean. So the important thing to remember is it's an education tool. It's a very good and exciting visual for you to use for planning your own meals and the meals of your clients. When you look at it, there's no surprise on what's needed on your plate. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. But just an overview, you can see that it's important to get all the food groups in. And it's important to accommodate all those food groups in every meal so that your body can utilize the nutrients so much better. When you're looking at this, you can see that there's a wide variety of colors that are necessary in your diet. You're also looking at this and realizing that protein is no longer the centerpiece on the plate, but it is really a side dish. And then the rest of the plate should make up your other nutrients. When we talked about the nutrient distributions in chapter one, we mentioned that carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, should take up the majority of the food on your plate. And you can see that in this visual. Protein is one-fourth of the plate. And then carbohydrates, which encompass your fruits, your vegetables, and your grains, should make up the majority of the food. We also need a wide variety of color. Uh, vegetables taking center stage. Fruit is very important. At least half of your grains should be whole grains. And then as a side note, it's very important to get dairy in every day. So each one of these food groups provides certain nutrients that you can't get from other groups. And that's why it's important to have a varied diet. We talked about that in chapter one, how it's very important to have a variety of food because no certain food group provides all the nutrients you need. So I want you to refer to that My Plate handout in your module that shows the servings that are needed for each food group for various calorie levels. So the front of the handout actually shows you the icon, which is the My Plate. And on the back, it shows you all the different calorie levels that various people can eat. And then it also shows you the serving sizes of each of the food groups to achieve that calorie level. There's also various adaptations of this My Plate for vegetarian and also Mediterranean. So the Asian diet emphasizes more plant food, such as rice, veggies, fruit, beans, nuts, and vegetable oils. And the Mediterranean diet emphasizes vegetables, fruits, nuts, olive oil, and whole grains with little dairy or little meat. So when you're looking at the Mediterranean diet, for instance, meat is sort of a, maybe a once or twice a month protein source, and they're promoting more of a plant-based diet. So when you look at the Mediterranean diet, which is the gold standard, and the Asian diet, you'll notice looking at their chronic disease that they have less cardiovascular disease, as an example, than um, the U.S. population. And we're assuming that that is because of the you know, basis of the plant-based, uh, emph their emphasis in plant-based eating. Here's a sample of the Asian diet 
in the form of a food guide pyramid. And you'll see that the physical activity is the foundation, and then your carbohydrates are the important foundation in the diet with fruits, legumes, and seeds, and vegetables playing a very big part of that foundation. And then you can see in the very top, meat would be, you know, sort of a monthly thing. Sweets, eggs, and poultry would be a weekly food item in their diet. And then more option of uh, fish and shellfish and dairy would be um, more of a daily consumption. So you can see the, how that differs from what we're doing in the U.S. diet. The Mediterranean diet is the same way. It contains a lot more fruits and seafood and less dairy than the U.S. diet. So here we have the My Plate. And again, I'd like to emphasize the importance of using this when you're planning your own meals and use this when you're you know, planning meals for clients. It's the basis for how to build a healthy eating style. The My Plate icon emphasizes the proportion of fruit, vegetable, grains, protein, and dairy food groups to be consumed daily throughout your lifetime. So it supports those dietary guidelines with consumer relevant themes and easy to understand action oriented messages that focus on key behaviors. So if you uh, open up to your chapter two in the book, you'll see these messages that are encouraged when you're looking at this my plate or when you're building a meal plan. Number one is val balancing calories to manage weight. So it's very important, like we talked about in chapter one, to understand the importance of knowing what your calorie budget is. When you know that, then you know how many fruits and vegetables and grains and proteins. So we want to encourage enjoying food, but maybe eat less of it, especially when you compare the average American diet. I think a lot of times people are eating bigger portions than they need. So we want to focus on avoiding oversized portions. And a good way to do that is just changing the size of the plate, which automatically makes the portion sizes of each food group smaller. This uh, My Plate also focuses on uh, food and nutrients to increase. And we'd like to promote making half of the plate fruits and vegetables. So when you look at this icon or this visual, it shows you that half of the plate should be full of color. And when you look at your plate and you're planning your meals, the more color, you know you're getting a wide variety of nutrients. This is also promoting grains and the importance of having at least half of your grains as whole grains. And that will mean so much more to you in the coming slides because we're gonna talk more about it. But a lot of times we focus on eating refined grains like white bread and white rice and white pasta. And the message within the My Plate concept is to promote at least half of your grains as whole grains to get more antioxidants and also fiber in the diet. Another message about a food or nutrient to increase would be switching from uh, whole milk dairy products to fat-free or low-fat. And the message there is that it's very important to individualize for your clients and for the, you know, for the general public. Some people are already getting a lot of saturated fat in the diet, and that's why the message is to switch to low-fat or fat-free dairy. There's also a message of foods to reduce, and that is to be cognizant of the sodium content of food, like soups, frozen meals, and canned goods. You know, it's really important to compare the sodium content in those foods to choose the lower sodium items. A lot of highly processed foods have a lot of sodium. When you're eating a whole food diet that fits into the My Plate, there's not as much of a concern about sodium, but when you start incorporating a lot more of the highly processed foods into the, the meal planning, it's very important to understand the concept of how much sodium is in the food you're eating. Another food to reduce is to focus on getting a lot more water instead of sugary drinks. So when we're building a healthy eating plan, we want to account for all foods and beverages consumed and assess how they fit into the total healthy eating pattern. There's also a message in the My Plate 
that talks about food safety recommendations when preparing and eating foods to reduce the risk of foodborne illness. And I know those of you who have taken your food safety courses are very knowledgeable about that. But that is an important message to consider when we're planning meals. So this is uh, the introduction to the five food groups. The My Plate again translates the principles of the dietary guidelines and also other nutritional standards to help people make better food choices. There's an assumption in there that oils and empty calories are also included. So for instance, we don't necessarily include oil as food group, but we know that we're cooking with oil and adding oil as a salad dressing or on our salads or maybe even um, you know, something spread on our sandwiches. Empty calories refer to, you know, sugary sweets, pies, cakes, cookies, jams, jellies, anything that has a lot more sugar. The food is not necessarily as nutrient dense. We don't include those as a food group, but know that there's a certain percentage of those allowed in our meal planning, which we'll continue to talk about. My plate really expects people to choose foods from the food groups that are most nutrient dense. And that's an important term that we're going to cover, but it's really important to focus on, you know, foods that have a lot more nutrition and less uh, of the foods that don't have it. So, for instance, we mentioned already water. Water is a very important nutrient as opposed to drinking a lot of soft drinks or sugary drinks. It's not that they're not allowed, it's just that they don't fit into the healthy eating plan. And when you include those kinds of things, you're utilizing your calorie budget that could be used for other food that would provide a whole lot more nutrition. So it's important to you know drink water in place of regular soda or have your low fat dairy instead of whole milk or maybe have extra lean ground beef instead of regular. Those are just some examples of things that you can incorporate into your meal planning. So when you're looking at these two items, which food do you think has more nutrient density? The eight ounce glass of milk or an eight ounce serving of cola, soft drink? Obviously the answer would be milk. And here you can see that you hit the easy button. Nutrient density is a measure of nutrients provided in a food per calorie of that food. So like for instance, broccoli has a whole lot more nutrient density than a chocolate cupcake with frosting. It has a high nutrient density because it's high in nutrients and very low in calories. So it packs a lot of nutrition in a small number of calories. So you can see the difference here. You know, broccoli has a little bit of protein, a lot more fiber than a cupcake, and then you look at your vitamins and it has a whole lot more nutrients in general. So that's what we mean by nutrient density, and I would really try to remember that concept. So here's a chart, very interesting chart, that you don't have to memorize, but it's important to know it's a really good reference. It's important to know how many calories you should be eating every day. And when you're planning a meal, it's especially important to understand there's big differences between, let's say if you're planning a meal for a child age two versus you know, uh, planning a meal for a 19-year-old male. You can see there's quite a different calorie spread. Um, it's important to know the number of calories needed per day of the people that you're feeding. Once you know your calorie level, you can see how much you need to eat from all the food groups. There's a table, it's 2-2 on page 40 in your textbook, and there's also a handout in your module on the My Plate that also provides that information for each calorie level. So again, this is a very good reference. The next slide gives an example of how much food per day is equivalent to eating 2,000 calories. So for instance, if you're planning a meal for someone eating 2,000 calories, they should have the equivalent of six ounces of grains and about two and a half cups of vegetables, two cups of fruit, three cups of milk, or the equivalent, 
of dairy, five and a half equivalents of lean meat and beans, six teaspoons of oil, and approximately less than 300 calories from empty calorie foods. So that just kind of gives you a rundown of what the meal plan would look like for the, a standard person eating 2,000, 2000 calories. So this is kind of what it looks like if you're eating whole food. And you'll notice that it, it's a lot of food actually. If you're consuming a lot of fast food or if you're eating frozen dinners that have a lot of fat in them, there's less food. But when you're eating whole food and you're, you're opening it up to some of the message, those messages that we talked about, you're actually getting a whole lot more food. This slide shows three meals and snacks that total 2,000 calories and it uses the MyPlate guidelines. The exact amount of foods in these plans don't need to be achieved every day, but on average over time. So that's one other thing to consider. Most people don't eat perfect every day. We wouldn't expect you to eat perfect every day. I always recommend to my clients that it's important to always achieve progress, to always achieve choosing healthier choices. So these may be a little unusual for the average, you know, a young adult. A lot of people at that age are stopping at Sonic for breakfast and maybe a fast food restaurant for, for lunch. For breakfast, we have sheared eggs with sauteed broccoli rabe and tomato salsa. You can see there's some grapefruit sections and some cranberry lime juice. And that can be traded out for a scrambled egg with left leftover veggies from the night before and maybe a, a different fruit or a fruit cup. For lunch on this tray, we're including a turkey and vegetable wrap, probably with whole grain tortilla wrap, some dried veggie chips, some Greek yogurt with berries, and some coconut orange water. So here we're incorporating, again, all the different food groups. We have your whole grain from your tortilla wrap. We have your turkey, which is your protein. You can obviously see a lot of vegetables in your wrap. You can see the fruit that you're getting with your dairy serving. And then, of course, all of your vegetables that are from the dried. So if, I, if I'm actually looking at that in terms of the my plate, I can see that I have three quarters of a my plate covered with you know, complex carbohydrates. And then you can see the snack on the plate, which is the crudités, cold raw vegetables with roasted pepper hummus. Hummus is a very good source of protein because it comes from chickpeas. It's made uh, from chickpeas. And in this particular hummus, they've actually used roasted red bell pepper, which incorporates yet another vegetable from the vegetable group that incorporates a lot more nutrition. And then, of course, we have our dinner, which is a sliced sirloin. And they've used a technique, a behavioral technique, to make a small three-ounce portion of steak look bigger on the plate because of the way they've cut it and laid it out. So the sirloin steak was with a mushroom ragu, a wheat berry pilaf with roasted rutabagas, and coconut mint water. So you can see on this plate that we are including red meat, which is perfectly wonderful choice. It has a good source of iron, but the serving size is adequate. It's the right size portion. And then for those people who may want or, you know, require a little bit more, we've included the mushroom ragu, which has a very good sensation of umami, taste sensation. So it's giving you that meat appeal. And it's a lot of food. It's a lot of texture. It's a lot of variety. And that's really what we're going for when we're doing our meal planning. The nutrient con contribution of some of these food groups, like for instance your veggies, we're getting a lot of dietary fiber, vitamins A and C, folate, potassium, magnesium. Same thing with the fruit, a lot of fiber, vitamin C, folate, potassium, magnesium. And then we have our grains, which are your whole grain bread, your whole wheat tortilla, your wheat pilaf, and you're getting carbohydrates and a lot of dietary fiber, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, folate, iron, magnesium, selenium. And then as a result of incorporating the dairy, which would be the yogurt, we're adding more protein, vitamin A and D, and also calcium, 
which you can see is not readily available in any of the other foods. And then of course our protein from the eggs and the turkey and the sirloin is providing the wonderful source of protein, thiamine, riboflavin, B12, vitamin E, iron. Iron, you get a lot of iron from your um, sirloin. So this is what we mean by, you know, proper meal planning is to consider getting all those food groups in and therefore providing a lot more, um, you know, variety than we had, um, had imagined. So when we're covering the my plate, we're looking at all these different food groups. And when we're including the vegetable group, it doesn't just mean raw and fresh. Any vegetable or 100% vegetable juice counts as a member of the food group, the vegetable food group. Veggies may be raw or cooked, fresh, frozen, canned, dried or dehydrated. They can be whole, cut up, or mashed. When we're referring to that vegetable food group, we're referring to any vegetable or 100% vegetable juice. Both of those count as a member of that food group. Veggies can be raw or cooked, fresh, frozen, canned or dried, dehydrated, and can be whole, cut up, or mashed. Veggies fall into five different subgroups based on their nutrient content. And uh, you can refer to the slide, and, and again, on page 41 of your textbook, to really identify you know, some of the specific veggies that you can incorporate. And they broke it down into five food groups so that you realize that and there's a lot of different variety. Like for instance, your dark green vegetables. Instead of incorporating a, um, like an iceberg lettuce salad, incorporate romaine or spinach or kale. Any of your dark green vegetables are gonna provide a whole lot more nutrients. Then we have our red and orange veggie group. You know, like your tomatoes and your, um, your uh, butternut squash and you know anything that's deep orange. And in the veggie group, we also incorporate our dried beans and peas, like soybeans and pinto beans and uh, black-eyed peas. Um, starchy vegetables are also incorporated into this group, such as potatoes and you know anything that's starchy. And then, of course, we have a lot of other vegetables as well. So we're trying to promote the importance of eating within the subgroups as well. When we're referring to a serving, vegetable recommendations are generally given in cups. So when you're eating from the my plate concept, one cup of raw or cooked vegetables or vegetable juice is considered a cup. When it comes to raw leafy greens, such as a salad, two cups are considered to be a cup from the veggie group. And you can see on the right hand side of the slide all the different nutrients that you get from eating from the vegetable group. Dietary fiber, which is very important for lowering our risk of heart disease, aiding in our digestion, elimination, you know, overall good health. Vitamin A is very important in this group and it really helps to keep our eyes and skin healthy. Vitamin C is very helpful in, um, you know, keeping our gums and teeth healthy, and folate helps make new cells, and of course potassium helps maintain a healthy blood pressure. So eating a variety gives us again a variety of nutrients. At 2,000 calories, a person would require about two cups of fruit. So what is a cup of fruit? It's equal to one cup of fruit or 100% fruit juice, and, you know, we, we always encourage people to in, include fruit over fruit juice, and primarily because you get more satisfaction in eating whole fruit as opposed to the juice, because fruit provides that fiber. It's very necessary to keep us satisfied. A cup of fruit is equivalent to a half a cup of dried fruit. So if you're eating raisins or cranberries, you know, it would be a half a cup because anything dried is more concentrated in calories. So when you're eating fruit, it has a whole lot more liquid or water, 
when you're drying a fruit, you're concentrating everything, not only the calories, but also the nutrients. So you shouldn't shy away from fruit thinking it's very sweet. You should include it, but just understand that the serving size is a little different. One serving of fruit would be a small two inch diameter apple. So if you're eating a very large apple, like some in the grocery store, then you realize that a half of an apple is really a serving. So these are very important, even though we know at a certain calorie level how many servings of fruit we need, it is so important to understand what that serving looks like. So a large banana, a large orange, 32 seedless grapes, or a medium pear. So we're going to talk about this again when we get to the carbohydrate chapter. But I love to really reiterate that, you know, some people really are concerned about eating fruit because of the sugar. And I want you to realize that fruit has natural sugar. It's called fructose. And it's very essential in our diet because when you eat fruit, you're getting the necessary fiber and you're getting all the vitamins and minerals that you can't get when you're eating some of those other, um, other foods. So again, when you eat your fruit, you're getting, you know, calories, but it's not near as high in calories as, as your sugary drinks or any other food that you're eating. It doesn't have any cholesterol, doesn't have any fat, doesn't have any sodium, and it's a very good source of vitamin C, potassium, folate, and dietary fiber. Why should we eat fruits and veggies? Because it has shown that it can help reduce our incidence of cardiovascular disease. And they're very low in calories. So again, you get so much nutrition. They're so much more nutrient dense than other foods that you can get. And again, they contribute those nutrients that generally we don't get enough of in our daily diet. So it's very important. And whether you're eating meals that you cook at home or that you're preparing for other people or that you're eating out, you can seek out these food groups. You know, many times they're not necessary, necessarily included on the plate or on the menu, but you can ask for them. You know, think about some of the fast food restaurants that are now incorporating a small fruit cup in place of a french fry. So everyone's getting on the bandwagon. There's a lot of different ways to incorporate fruits and veggies, and I include this on here and like to review it because a lot of people don't even really know. They, they don't have the creativity to incorporate them beyond, you know, grabbing an apple for a snack. But think about, you know, grilling some of your stone fruit, like uh, peaches or, or even maybe a pineapple for even a dessert instead of having a cake or a pie or a cookie. But you can brush a little bit of oil on there and just grill your fruit and think about all the wonderful flavor that you're incorporating. Think about adding a lot of veggies or even fruit to sandwiches and pizza and casseroles. Like I mentioned before, even scrambling them into your eggs in the morning. But what you're doing is you're adding a wonderful flavor and texture and you're getting a lot of extra food that doesn't have a lot of calories it actually satisfies you. So when you're making a salad, incorporate a lot of different veggies. Remember to, you know, eat from the rainbow. Smoothies are also a good idea. Blending fresh and even frozen fruit that doesn't have any sugar with, you know, fruit juice or sometimes you don't even need the fruit juice. There's a lot of different uh, high-tech blenders on the market that, you know, allow you to you know, blend frozen fruit and even use it as a sorbet. When you're blending your smoothies, also remember to incorporate some vegetables in there and not just fruit. You know, it can change the color, but think about all the extra nutrients that you're incorporating, which would be a wonderful thing if you're uh, preparing a meal or a smoothie for someone who really doesn't like vegetables. You can also make dips and serve, you know, fruits and veggies. There's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong uh, with dipping your veggies in some ranch dressing, especially for children who turn their nose to certain veggies. I'd rather see them have the veggies with a little bit of dip than, and, than not eat the vegetables at all. 
So, you know, just remember to uh, use your imagination and think about all the different ways that we can incorporate those wonderful fruits and vegetables in our diet. This next slide talks about whole grains. And on your visual that we have of the my plate, it says grain, but we're actually referring to whole grain. Whole grains contain the fiber rich bran and the vitamin rich germ. On the next slide, we'll be looking at what exactly that looks like. But a whole grain is any food that's made from wheat, rice, oats, cornmeal, or other cereal grain. Those are all grain products. Pasta, bread, oatmeal, breakfast cereals, tortillas, and grits are examples of food that are made from grains. Grains are divided into two groups. You have your whole grain and you have your refined grain. Another word for refined is milled. Whole grains contain that whole kernel. And we're going to look at a photo of it in just a second. There are eight grains that are commonly consumed today. We have our wheat, corn, and that could be the maize, and also popcorn, rice, oats, barley, rye, millet, and sorghum. Other plants that are becoming more popular these days are things like quinoa, amaranth, and buckwheat, as well as wild rice. These are actually considered pseudo-grains or false grains, because although they're, they have a different botanical origin, they're similar to a cereal grain in composition and in use. So for the purposes of whole grain, we're referring to the wheat, the corn, the rice, the oats, the barley, the millet, and the sorghum. But when we're planting meals, remember to incorporate some of those other popular plants like quinoa, buckwheat, wild rice, because it gives us such a wonderful variety. Those are our whole grains. Now our refined grains, on the other hand, are grains that have been milled. During that milling process, the three parts are separated and recombined according to achieve different types of flour. They've been enriched since 1941 with iron and 3B vitamins, riboflavin, niacin, and thiamine. In fact, Riboflavin and thiamine are added back at twice the original amounts. So the way to think about it is whole grains contain all the grain and nutrients, and the milled or refined, the uh, different parts are separated out, and by law, the nutrients have to be incorporated back in. So here's a picture of our grain of wheat. Whole grains and grain products are made from the entire grain seed, usually called the kernel, and it consists of the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. The bran, as you can see, is the outer layer, and that contains the largest amount of fiber. The endosperm, which is the middle layer, contains mostly protein and carbohydrate, along with some small amounts of B vitamins. The germ layer, that's the inner part, is a very rich source of trace minerals, unsaturated fats, B vitamins, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. So you can see how important it is to eat the whole grain because when it's milled out, when it's processed, the three parts are separated and some nutrients are lost. And the one big thing is the fiber. You know, fiber is so necessary in the, in the American diet. Most people are only getting about 9 grams of fiber a day, when in essence we need about 30, 25 to 35 grams. So it's very important to consider whole grain for that reason. And in shopping, you'll notice you can buy wheat bran and you can buy wheat germ. Endosperm is really what's left when we're, you know, re refining the product and turning it into white bread and white flour and also pasta. Whole grains have so many more nutrients. So we're talking about a lot more fiber, vitamin E, B6, magnesium, zinc, potassium, and a whole lot more than white flour. 
Refined grains are enriched, like I mentioned, by law with five nutrients that are lost in processing. Those are thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, folate, and iron. When we're eating grains or incorporating those into our meal planning, if you're planning for 2,000 calories, a person needs six ounce equivalents every day, and at least half of those should be whole grain. So that's the message in the grain group. What we mean by a six ounce equivalents, one equivalent is equal to a slice of bread, a cup of ready-to-eat cereal, a small muffin, half a cup of cooked rice, pasta, or cereal, and a half of an English muffin or hamburger roll. Now, when you look at this, it doesn't mean that you only have to eat a half of a hamburger roll. You can have the, the whole bun, but you realize that that is two equivalents. So throughout the day, if you're eating 2,000 calories, that means you can have six servings or six one-ounce equivalents. So if you have a cup of cereal in the morning, that's one serving. Maybe you're having a sandwich at lunch, that's two more servings. And then maybe a small muffin for a mid-afternoon snack. And maybe you decide to have a cup of whole grain pasta with your dinner. And that would be your six servings for the day. So it's, um, it's tricky, but the important thing to realize is you have to get more accustomed to understanding what a typical serving should be, not what people normally eat. So if you're going to a um, never-ending pasta bowl restaurant and you're eating possibly, you know, three cups of pasta, you have to realize that you might be getting your six servings or six ounce equivalents at one meal. And that is exactly what's happened to the American diet. You know, we're not uh, privy to what serving should be, and therefore people are eating way more than their uh, calorie budget allows. When we mentioned that half of the grain should be whole grain, there's a lot of different ways um, to make at least half of your grains whole grain. If a food contains at least eight grams of whole grains per ounce, as usually listed on the label, then it's considered to be 50% whole grain. So if you're eating 100% whole grain bread, for instance, three slices would provide that number of whole grain. If you're eating half of, if you're eating two servings of 100% whole grain wheat bread and two servings of partially whole grain, then it takes more servings to get the amount of fiber you need. You have to consider the number of calories you're consuming. So anyway, there's a lot of different ways to get your grains in, but half of your grains should be whole grain, and you should be looking for the terms 100% whole grain when you're purchasing your uh, grain products. The next group is actually your dairy group. The dairy group includes milk, cheese, fortified soy milk, and when we're looking and planning meals, we want to be sure that most of the choices should be fat-free or low-fat. Now, even though cream cheese, cream, and butter are considered dairy foods, they're not really included in this food group because they don't have the calcium that the milk, the cheese, fruit, and the other foods do. Um, like, for instance, milk, cheese, yogurt, soy milk. Even though you would consider cream cheese, cream, and butter as part of the dairy foods, it's not really incorporated into the dairy group for the my plate meal planning, primarily because it doesn't have as much calcium. So the focus on the dairy group is based on how much calcium you need in a, at a certain age. The nutrients that we get from the dairy group is not only the calcium, which is important for bone and teeth health, but also vitamin D. Vitamin D is the nutrient that allows your body to utilize calcium um, for you know good bone and teeth health. So it's the key that unlocks your body's ability to use calcium. The dairy group also contains potassium and then of course protein.